Tonight we have with us Jack McKisson, previously a physics, an engineering physics professor, and uh, currently we're very lucky to have him working here at the lab as an engineer in our detector imaging group. So he's going to talk to you about physics you already know. Uh, if you'd please join me in welcoming Jack McKisson. Great. Great. Oh, they all made it. All right. Thank you. I am so glad to see so many people here. Thanks for coming. Let's see. Let's make sure my uh, control remains with me. No. There. Yes. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is the physics that you already know. So how many already know physics? Ooh. Now, wait a minute. I said you already know it, and so you already are giving me some problems. So I, I think that maybe you know more physics than you think. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's a little bit out of the lecture that I will give my students at the university who come into that physics class, and the physics class is going to be the hardest class they ever take at the university, and they're terrified of it because they've heard some people have to take it three or four times. And the point that I'm going to make is, look, you don't have to worry about any of that. Physics is easy because you already know so much of it. I work in the uh, detector and imaging group here at Jeff Lab. And this group is a support group. We do a lot of things for the lab, the various halls. We build detectors. And in the last few years, we've also begun doing things where we're building detectors that are specialized in doing imaging. Uh, you can see there's a wonderful orchid that's sitting in front of some silvery boxes, and that refers to a, an interesting project that we've been doing on imaging plants. So we don't just do people or other kinds of things like that. This uh, group of, this collage of, of pictures shows a few of the things we're doing with that plant imaging. In the center is a 3D reconstruction of a, of a, of a little oak seedling and we're monitoring and viewing the motion of radioactive sugars down through the stem. Can't see much of the leaves, they're sort of out of the picture, but we're looking at that bright section in the, in the center as the sugars moving down the stem. Turns out that they haven't been able to do that before. And even when I was in high school, I thought, gee, they've been doing this all the time. Some of the other stuff we're doing in, involves some clinical and preclinical applications for what you might call medical imaging. Uh, some of it is with uh, clinical applications in people. We're associated with the, uh, the group here, Dillon Technologies, which has taken some of the developments from our group and uh, created and, and is selling a breast imaging system. Uh, we're, we've worked with uh, a group out at University of Virginia which is currently using in surgery a surgical probe. We call it the gamma puck there in the center. And uh, okay, so preclinical, we're working with mice on a system that uh, allows the scientists to view and image the mice without anesthetizing the mice. Typically, they have to make them stand still. You know how you go to an x-ray, what do they do? They say, okay, take a deep breath. <gasps> okay. So during that time that you're standing still, they're taking the x-ray because they don't want you to move, right? You can't tell a mouse that. Okay, you can tell a mouse that, but he doesn't listen. So the system we designed here that's up at Johns Hopkins allows the mouse to move around. We keep track of where he is, and then we reconstruct the image without telling him to sit still. Okay, so I told you you already know physics. And uh, this guy obviously knows a lot of physics because they've given him a degree. But truly, there have been some studies, several studies, in fact, they understand this quite well, that infants as young as two months already understand many of the physical properties of, of matter. They understand that solid things are solid and they don't pass through one another. <coughs> they understand that things are continuous. Objects don't just pop into existence or pop out of existence. And it's that thing, that very thing that magicians take advantage of because you know that things just don't disappear. So when a magician makes something disappear, you're very surprised. You knew that since the time you were two months old. By the time you get to be three months, infants understand things about materials such as liquids can be separated. They will spill and spread. Solids tend to keep the same shape. 
And they've demonstrated that infants at that age already know that. And they've shown also that as young as five months, six months, infants are able to recognize when you've, if they've had some small number of objects and you take one away, they'll recognize that you've taken one away. As you get a little older, you get to know a little bit more. So how do you suppose those infants knew all that stuff? OK, you, got, you can talk, too. But you do, oh, that's the word. Thank you. It's observation. What tools does the infant do, do we have when we're two and three months old? Can't read about it. No, it's just observation. And so I want to point out something. Does, do we have any baseball players here? Do we have any baseball players that are sort of in the front row? OK, someone who can catch. OK, here we, uh, we have a volunteer. I want you to observe this. Did you see that? I pushed on this ball, and I made this ball fly through the air. The, the ball flew through the air, and, and she caught it. You knew everything that ball was going to do from the moment it left my hand after I was able to influence it, and you were able to completely predict it. And you, do that, you knew that because experience. You had observed balls moving through the air many times. Maybe you play tennis. So toss it back. OK. So that observation was a couple of things. One, she watched the ball move and was able to adjust and catch it. Some people call it skill. I call it being able to know the physics that's going on. She knew that the ball wasn't going to keep rising, even though when I first threw it, it was rising. She knew it was going to get to the top and fall back down. It helps to know that the ball's going to bounce. That made her a little less afraid to catch it. And if I threw it hard, we could do that too. So why, do we, why are we able to do this? Because all of these things around us are very natural things. And that's where the word physics comes from. Physics comes from this word, the, neutral, the neuter plural of physicos, which just means of nature. The Greeks came up with that one. Well, I suppose we, we borrowed it from them. And it was developed and pushed along, but, but people decided that was pretty good. So all I'm talking about when I say you know physics is that you've observed nature. And so now physics has become the study of natural things and the behavior of natural things. So what's going to happen when I drop this ball? You've seen me already drop it. It's going to fall down to the floor, and then it's going to hit the floor, and it's going to bounce up again, right? We've seen it happen several times. So you know now, with a little bit of experience, a little bit of observation, that that's what's going to happen with this ball. Well, that's mostly what I'm talking about here. Greek philosophers a long time ago considered these very same things, the same things that you considered from the time you were two months old. Uh, Aristotle, this gentleman here, was uh, clever enough to have written a lot of the stuff down that he was thinking about. And one of the things that he decided was that objects have a natural place. So he, he looked at things in the world, and he decided that these objects had a natural place. Clearly, this on the table was not the natural place for the tennis ball, was it? These tennis balls seem to like that, that place. And that was what he said. He said, oh, everything has its natural place. Rocks, when you throw them into the air, they have this urge to be, go back to their natural place. And so, of course, rocks will find their way back to the ground, which is their natural place. Bubbles underwater have their natural place. Of course, it's up in the sky. That's where bubbles and air and things like that go. So the bubbles underwater are going to rise up to get to their natural place in the sky. Water will run to, its, to the lakes and the streams because that's their natural place. Was he right? Maybe. Maybe. He had a pretty good theory, and uh, they, they stuck with it for a long time. I have a conjecture. It might not be exactly the right theory. It might be, there might be a problem with this, this concept of natural places. 
And one of the problems they had was the idea of impetus. That when you took a rock and you, and you pushed a rock and threw the rock, that you gave that rock some impetus. It was something that came out of your being alive that you were able to do that because certainly one rock sitting next to another rock never, gives, never give each other impetus. They don't make each other move. But a person who's alive can pick that up. A tree can grow and push a rock out of the way with its roots growing. And they decided that impetus was the thing. Ah, that's what makes things move. You apply a force and forces make things move. But the impetus wore away after a while. It kind of dissolved away, faded. And so as this rock moved through the air, it, it, it got this urge to be back down in its natural place. That was a pretty good theory, and they stuck with, with everybody for many years. One of the problems, though, is it stuck with everyone because nobody yet had a really good theory that uh, opposed Aristotle's theory. Or if they wrote about it, somebody else said, nah, nah, nah. So he still made some errors. And in this case, the, these two guys arguing, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Galileo in a few minutes but uh, they already had an argument about how this worked. Okay, Ptolemy, he also had some interesting ideas. Around the same time, another one of those Greek guys, these old Greek guys, we spent a lot of time with them, dealing with those, but uh, do you notice what's wrong with this model of the universe? They call this the geocentric. The Earth is at the center of the universe in this model. And outside, you can see, if you down on the right-hand right hand lower side, you can see that closest to the Earth is Luna, and then Mercury, and Venus, and then the Sun, and then Mars. Uh, you all have learned a different solar system model, right? I hope so. Is anyone still studying this one? <laughs> OK, good. Uh, this model, however, persisted for a long time. OK, there's other things. There's other problems that we have in doing observations. Maybe you're familiar with this particular little conundrum here. This is a view of a guy who's swinging a rock around on a string. He's swinging it around pretty fast. And that string's going to break right at the point there where it's black. And so in one picture, the, the, the rock is going to move essentially straight down. And in the other picture, the rock is going to curve around. So, with a show of hands, how many people think it's going to be this way? This picture on the right. Raise your hand if, you're, if, you're, if you've decided. You're going to have to raise your hand. None of this like this. No, no, raise your hand like this. OK. And now, how many people think it's going to happen like on the left? Now, how do those people on the right feel now? They, it must go like that because it's been curving already, right? No. I'm afraid that it is the one on the left. But for those who chose the one on the right, about 50% of people who are asked who have no science formal education will look at this and choose the picture on the right because it seems really reasonable. And that's one of the problems with observation that we have. A lot of things seem really reasonable. And if you're not going to go out and do that experiment, you might think about, think about all kinds of things that are slightly erroneous. OK, observation is probably the most important part about learning about physics. And I bring up this guy, Tycho Brahe, because he was a wonderful observer. He was, I use the word here, meticulous. And he took so, such great care with an instrument as pictured something like on the left there. Actually, he built several of them larger and larger each time. And he measured the positions of the planets and the stars to a precision that's about 1.5 minutes of arc. Now, if you hold your thumb out at arm's length, everybody do that. Don't poke the person in front of you. You look at the width of your thumb, and that's about one degree. OK, now imagine slicing your, oh, imagine something 1 the width of your thumb. That's pretty small. That's how accurate 
Tycho Brahe made his observations and carefully recorded them all. Kepler was his assistant. The difference between Brahe and Kepler was that while Brahe was carefully cataloging every one of these measurements, Kepler was looking at them and saying, wow, th this kind of, wait a minute, this one goes with this one. There's a ratio here. Wait a minute, this might mean that he took a look at what Brahe's careful observations were, and he was no slouch at making observations either, but he did some interesting things with recognizing the patterns in the observations that Brahe had made that Brahe never recognized. Kepler recognized that, wow, I could take the platonic solids. These are these, these, are these objects that you've already probably been familiar with. The cube is one, octahedron, tetrahedron, uh, dodecahedron, and icosahedron. Plato thought these were all particularly special objects that you could build with uh, simple, simple shapes. Kepler found that if you circumscribed a circle within, and inscribed a circle within, and circumscribed a sphere, sorry, around each one of those, and nested them as pictured on the right and bottom, that you, and if you did that in the right order, that you could build a model of the solar system and get the sizes of the orbits correctly. Now this was an interesting construction. He nested them in a particular way, decided what the sphere sizes would be, and took a look at Brahe's observations about the orbits of the planets and discovered that, wow, this, th th this actually agrees pretty closely. But it turns out that not only did they agree pretty closely, but later on, another gentleman would take a look at, at Kepler's work and say, wow, this also means that my theory is right. And so these careful observations of Brahe's and Kepler's along with the recognition that, that Kepler did, led to several things. One of the things that uh, you study in most physics courses is Kepler's laws. I apologize because there's an equation here. It's down there in the bottom. I hid it in words. <laughs> but these three laws, that the orbits of all the planets are, are on ellipses, and the sun is at one of the two foci of that ellipse, that was an interesting observation that the others really didn't recognize before, not even Bright. And the line joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times, that is a daunting proof even for a mathematics major, but he did it. And then this last one, I'm not even going to try to talk with you about because it involves squares and cubes and ratios and proportionality. So the important part is that Kepler without a graphing calculator, was able to deduce these things from those observations that Brahe made. Galileo came along about the same time, followed these guys a little bit later, and he was another kind of observer. But he, he did something that was different than most of these other guys doing in ob observing. He was also an experimenter. Previously, the scientific guys they, they would do some experiments, but they, would, they really would not do too much experiments because the people around them gave very little credence to experiments. It was, it was a little bit like they considered experiments just magic tricks. You could demonstrate something obviously, clearly, and the people would, just, would think of them as magic tricks. Galileo managed to take that sense of experimentation and make it much more of a reality, and people actually believed his experiments. He also was an inventor. He had problems doing certain kinds of experiments that needed good timing. He tried the clocks he could buy. Oh, he couldn't buy any clocks. They didn't have clocks. He invented a clock. He was also interested in measuring angles very accurately. And there's a picture of actually a, an instrument that he built, uh, a, a protractor for measuring angles. It was a little bit of a hawkish thing. He was really doing that for the military so that the engineers could better aim the cannons to uh, better attack the enemies. Another thing, Galileo made a wonderful observation. Other people have seen this. This lamp you see hanging in the middle of this 
cathedral at uh, Pisa. This lamp hangs from a long cord and it swings. And he noticed that the period of its swing was independent of the magnitude of its swing. So some days it wasn't swinging very far. And some days it was swinging quite a distance, but the period of the pendulum was independent of the magnitude of its swing. Does anyone know the equation? No. OK, you'll get that when you take a formal physics course. That led to the clocks that stayed around for many hundreds and hundreds of years. The Tower of Pisa, everyone knows that uh, it was Galileo who dropped two rocks off the Tower of Pisa and he demonstrated that they fall at the same time, right? No, I'm giving you the hint here. It's actually one of his biographers started that bad rumor. It was a different experimenter, but it shows that Galileo managed to make that experimentation thing quite acceptable. Many people started doing experiments and the people around those experiments started thinking about them, dealing with them, and uh, recognizing them as something other than just a conjurer's trick. So Galileo studied things in motion. And one of the things he studied was how things move, how things fall. He did not study how things rise, but he didn't have electric motors. Uh, what he used a lot of was inclined planes. Most of them were not as curvy as this one is here, but he used the same idea. And the reason he used it was it slowed down time. It slowed down the time of the fall enough that he could time how long it took an object to roll down or slide down an inclined plane. When you get to physics, you will find that there is a problem with rolling versus sliding. That uh, He compared lightweight things. And let me get some heavyweight things. And he compared the heavyweight things. Hopefully, it'll hit the bucket. We did practice. Uh, and he compared two things going on two different ramps, although, like I said, his was probably straight rather than curvy. And he timed all that. The other thing he did was he took inclined planes and he noticed how objects rolled on the inclined planes. Did you notice that that took kind of a curve? You think I can do it again and uh, make it even a better curve? This takes a lot of practice. There we go. So he plotted those curves, timed those times, changed what the angle was on that inclined plane, made careful observations, wrote it all down, figured out the math, and he came up with a whole bunch of theories, explanations, and concepts. And we recognize those theories, those explanations, and those concepts as the beginning of the, the recognition that motion was not like Aristotle described. This was not about some sort of impetus that you would convey to the rock so that it would want to fly through the air for a while but finally give up and decide that it wants to be back in its natural place. He came up with the idea of inertia. Okay, so you all know what inertia is? Somebody? There's a few people who know what inertia is. Inertia is similar to that thing that makes you want to stay in bed on Saturday morning when it's raining. It makes, if something is not moving, it wants to stay not moving. Inertia is also that same thing that lets that bullet pass right through that apple. So the bullet, okay, so the, the line up there says, that's, that's uh, Galileo's definition of inertia. Uh, and it says that an object that's on a level surface, the, the bullet's not on a level surface there. It's flying through the air, but it's moving pretty fast. The bullet didn't slow down much. The uh, apple didn't fall over yet, uh, but if anybody is familiar with Edgerton's work, this apple explodes in the next couple of milliseconds here. And just because you've all seen it, or maybe not, you can go find it. I'm not going to show you the apple exploding. The point is, 
that this concept of inertia, that, that something will continue to move unless you really do something to stop it from moving, and if something stopped, you have to take some work, some force to change it from being stopped to start it moving. That was a unique thing, and it started to poke holes in Aristotle's argument. And because Galileo was so respected for doing such good experimentation, they paid attention. Newton came a little bit later. You've all heard of Newton. This guy was busy. He was a theologian. He was a professor. He was a philosopher, which meant he just wandered around the garden and, and talked about things with his students. And uh, he wrote this little thing, the name of it's down here, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Uh, who's taken calculus? OK. Differential calculus? Integral calculus? Differential equations? OK. Uh, along with another one of uh, his friends here, Leibniz. Newton is the one who came up with all that stuff. And he did it because the current mathematics could not explain his observations of the universe around him. Why didn't they, why, why didn't those observations work? Why, why didn't they work previously? Why didn't anyone notice that the that universe didn't behave that way? This was part of the problem that we had with the Greeks, like Aristotle. People just believed, and they said, well, you know, I think I see something that's different than what everyone believes. And they said, no, 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 I don't, we're not going to talk about that. You just hush. You must, have, you must have seen something. Yeah, well, we did see something. So I can't even begin to cover the things that uh, Newton talked about. He covered so many different subjects. All I'm going to stick with right now so no calculus, I promise. All I'm going to stick with right now is how Newton described motion. The first thing he talked about was this universal gravitation. There's another equation. Does anyone recognize it? You should have seen it if you've had some physics. The, the important part here is that r squared in the denominator. Because when Newton took a look at Kepler, remember Kepler's numbers and Kepler, uh, Brahe's observations and Kepler's findings and Kepler's descriptions of the solar system, Newton applied this equation and said, wow, every one of Kepler's orbits agrees with my finding here. So what he found was a new equation, a new description of how things operate that he could couch in mathematical terms, and it agreed with what Kepler had seen, every one of them. Here's the three laws of motion. I apologize. There's another equation there. This is only the third equation. Every object in a state of uniform motion tends to remain in that state of motion unless an external force is applied to it. That sounds suspiciously like what Galileo had said about inertia. And yes, some people refer to that as the inertial law. Now notice that it doesn't say anything about objects wanting to be in their natural place. Anything like that? Nothing. The next one talks about how much of a force one has to apply to some object to get it to change its motion through acceleration. And since I haven't defined force and I haven't defined acceleration, I'm going to rely on everyone here to recognize what force and acceleration is about, and we're, we'll leave that equation. The last one is even more interesting, most difficult for people to understand. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You all think you know what it's talking about. Because you've seen rockets, and they, that's the favorite one. They show you a rocket, and they say reaction, action, reaction, rockets move. Uh, maybe a few of you have been out standing on ice and have thrown a heavy object, and you've moved backwards because you threw that heavy object. But I want you to consider this, too. Has anyone noticed that I am not falling through the floor? Now, let's take for a moment this ball. If I let go of this ball, what's going to happen? It's going to fall and then bounce, right. OK. 
Why didn't it fall until I let go? Maybe it's easier if I hold it like this. I'm pushing up on that ball with a force that's equal to and perfectly balances the force of gravity on that ball. That's the force that uh, Newton talked about in that previous equation. When I fail to provide a force upward, the ball falls. falls. I go back to why am I not falling through the floor? Because the floor is providing sufficient force to keep me from falling through the floor. If it wasn't very strong, if this was some rickety uh, plywood, uh, OK, so half inch plywood, quarter inch plywood, yeah, maybe quarter inch plywood, I would break right through the floor. So let's ask another question. What happens if I throw this ball up? So how, OK, so we can't get those answers. But how many people know what's going to happen when I throw this ball up? An easier way to count hands is how many people aren't sure what's going to happen when I throw this ball up? Oh, so everyone knows. It's going to go up for a while. It's going to stop. And it's going to come back down. Everybody knew that. You knew that because what we've always already talked about, this, you, you have an expectation for th what things do in the universe. The tennis ball's small, harder to see. This one's bigger, a little bit easier to see. Everyone knows what this is going to do when I, let, when I quit providing the force that's holding it up against gravity. What's it going to do? It's going to fall. Then it's going to hit, it's going to bounce, right? And then I'm going to try to catch it. Oh. OK. So you had an expectation, and that violated your expectations. So you probably should have had me bounce it a couple of times like I was bouncing these tennis balls, and then you had been a lot more sure of it. Why did it stop falling when it got, when it got to the ground? Right there. Why did it stop falling? Go ahead. Shout. It I, think the, I think the rug stopped it. The floor stopped it from falling any further. There was enough opposite force applied to stop what it was doing, it was falling, and that additional force was applied until it stopped. If we dig a hole in the floor, it will keep going, I assure you. Some things, though, they don't keep moving. Like this book. This book is sitting here because the table is applying sufficient force upwards to keep it from falling down through the table, right? So you already know that answer because I've asked that a couple of times. So what if I push on this book? I can make this book move across the table, right? I, like, just like this. Comes to a stop when I stop pushing. But what if I just give it a push like this? Oh, well, maybe without the drape it would have. But still, the same thing happens. Why did it stop? Oh, there's the answer. Yeah, that's why it stopped. Friction. That friction stuff seems to get in the way of a lot of things we do. Friction seems to take away all sorts of things. In fact, when you're driving down the, down the road in your car, on the highway, most of the gasoline that you're burning in your car is going to overcome friction. Road friction, a little bit. Air friction, a lot more other frictions in, internal to your car. And so friction's kind of like the bad boy. We would really like to completely get rid of friction. Just do away with it entirely, right? So has anyone ever been stuck out in the middle of a frozen lake and lost, had your skates taken away? So you, now you can't skate to the edge using those sharp edges of the skates, which give you good friction. Yeah, so we need friction. The polar bear needs friction. He can't, get, he can't climb up the ice without his friction. Uh, fortunately, they give him claws. OK. So if we know a lot of this physics, uh, why should we even study it further? I mean, look, this entire place, Jefferson Lab, is here to study some particular little 
side part of physics that's not having much to do at all with this mechanics that I've been talking about, Newtonian mechanics. It's something entirely different. Uh, the only thing a regular physics course is going to tell you, beyond the sorts of things that, that we've already talked about and that you already know, is that it'll give you the opportunity to build some relationships from some equations that they'll force you to memorize. And then it'll let you put numbers to the things that you already know. You might be able to take and predict just how high the tennis ball would bounce. You might be able to predict just how far this book would slide before coming to a stop. In fact, I'm sure they will have you endlessly calculate all the different ways that that stuff will go. They might even have you compare a couple of different objects of different masses falling down the same roller coaster. And then they'll have you calculate the velocity and the energy at every point in the track and compare the two and compare where they end up. Doesn't seem like much fun when I put it that way, does it? it sounds more like homework. So why would anybody do that? I mean, OK, because they require you to take physics, right? But some people, as we know, understand physics a little bit better than others. And they, they will do really well in this physics stuff. Others, not so much. This guy has a real problem with physics. We probably know all of his adventures. OK, so for those of you who say, no, I, I don't want to take physics. I know how to throw a football. Yep, you do. I know how a, base, how a curve ball works. And that's what that picture is on the left. That's the difference in airflow around the ball. You can't tell that it's spinning there. But a pitcher doesn't learn how to throw a fast pitch curve ball by studying physics. He learns it because he comes to know the physics. The quarterback and his receivers don't learn to run a good pass pattern because they sit back in the back and do calculations with their graphing calculators and, and a book on calculus. No, they practice, but it's all physics that they're doing. They're doing it in their heads, and they're doing it not because they understand the numbers they get out of it, but they're doing it because the number that they put in the bank account because of that, at least the pro guys do. But some of the things that you might do with physics, like some of the things that I managed to do with physics, could be kind of fun. So when I was in graduate school, I was just going to be an engineer, uh, just an engineer. I was going to be an electrical engineer, and I, I'd known that for a long time. But I fell in with, with a band uh, when I was in graduate school. I, I fell in with a band of nuclear astrophysicists, and they changed my life. I still see and work with some of them today. Uh, I ended up doing so many things because I was the engineer guy who got to make the gizmos that the physicists needed to be made. And because of that, and because I worked in a small group, we got to do some really cool things. This picture is a photograph taken by one of, one of the guys I worked with, Gunther Eichhorn, of a high altitude balloon, the first one that was successfully launched from McMurdo in Antarctica. It carried a payload. You can't see it. It's quite a ways off to the right. And that balloon, once it's fully inflated, was about the size of a thousand moderate size houses inside. Had the same, it's 11 million cubic feet. Carried a payload up to look at a supernova, the gamma rays coming from a supernova. Another project that I had great fun, fun with down in Antarctica was a South Pole Aurora project totally different group of people I was working with. In this case, and you can see that's a picture of the uh, South Pole, the new station, South Pole Station. And above it, beautiful green aurora taken the year after I was there. I've also managed to do a little, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I, but I assist them all the time. 
And I've managed to get chances to f uh, build payloads flying on sounding rockets, as pictured on the left. And that's STS-28. The goes way back in 28, some launched somewhere in 1989 and carried an experiment that it was those nuclear astrophysics folks that I was working with. They said, hey, can you make one of these that'll do that? And then we convinced the, uh, the folks somehow to fly it on the shuttle. That was great. Fun. And so we've all made these observations. We all have recognized these things and we all use them day to day. Look, you all can probably catch that glass that's just about to tip over and spill on the countertop if you're fairly good at it, because you know just how that's going to move. If you drop something, many people are able to reach and catch it before it hits the floor. Hopefully it's not sharp. It's the observations, and it's the experiments. And with a little bit of creativity, you can take that and turn that into something that's a lot more fun. They actually pay me to do this stuff. And, and I have so much fun, I just can't get over it. That's all I've got. If anyone has any questions, there's a question. Very loud. Um, sir, could you uh, point out the other scientists who also discovered calculus off by himself? Leibniz. Yeah, and they were, you know, what's interesting about that, that, dis that discovery I'm not sure it was discovery, it was invention of calculus. Leibniz and Newton both were right about the same time. It was as if society was just ready for that. And so that kind of understanding about the way things changed and the way different things related to one another must have come out because society was ready for it. And so it happened in two completely different places. And it turns out they had fairly different views of exactly how it worked. But they were describing the same thing. They took two different approaches, and they were describing exactly the same thing. And they recognize now, and so now in your, in your calculus book, you will see a combination of Leibniz and Newtonian calculus. And the expressions and the notations for both are used because they're both useful depending on the application. So that's really boring for those people who aren't going to take calculus. How, who's not going to take calculus? No. Who is going to take calculus and has not yet? OK, yeah. Because uh, I can't tell you how much fun that is. I, I can't tell you that it'll get you a, a, a rocket experiment or a balloon experiment. It'll take you to Antarctica. But uh, calculus can be fun. What kind of time are we on? OK. So we still have more, lots more time for questions. OK, one last demonstration. I told you inertia was important, right? We have lost a few people. They're not, they're not going to know about this. So in your life, in your daily life, I told you that you know certain things about these principles of motion, and you use them in daily life. So in this case, I can demonstrate inertia with some things that I'm sure everyone knows. Do you all have these experimental apparatus in, in your house? Oh, yeah. I hope so. So, and you know, there is, there is this whole discussion about whether it rolls over the top or from the, so we're not going to get into that. What I am going to point out, though, is that it's very convenient to have a full roll because when you pull it off, it just breaks. Why? Perfect. No, it, it breaks at the perforation, yes. That's, that's probably a very good invention. I'm sure that whoever invented perforated paper is probably still a millionaire. Oh, no, that was hopefully a long time ago. Friction? Uh, no, actually. We could, we could probably, oh, there, there it is. There it is. Inertia. So what about this one? This is, this is a smaller roll. It doesn't have as much mass. So when I pull this one, I'm in big trouble now. Because someone's going to have to clean this up, and the lady's not here. So can I, oh, if I did it that way, it works. But that's a, but that's a concept that uh, uh, you, 
now I know what's going to happen. Y'all are going to go home and you're going to say, let me show you this. <laughs> the guy did this at the lecture last night. And so, actually, I, I think I should go and, and talk to the toilet paper salespeople and, and, and get some royalties off of sales for the next week or so because you're all going to be doing experiments and find out just exactly how full does the roll have to be before it stops tearing off. So you can do that experiment, but please don't credit me with the, uh, the reason for doing that, okay? Particularly, you know, and, and it was tough enough to, to be able to steal that from our house. I, I do have to take them back and reinstall them tonight or I'm in really big trouble. Okay, any other questions? They don't have to be questions about inertia. They don't even have to be massive questions. Did you notice I didn't really talk about mass much? No. Does anyone know what the basic quantities are that we measure? Yeah, there's someone in the back. What are, what's, give me two of the basic quantities. Uh, grams, meters. OK, those are units. So all right, so, but he's close. So someone take that and turn that into basic quantities, because someone in another universe somewhere is not going to call them grams and it's not going to call them meters, they're going to be what? So mass is a basic. Distance is another. So distance is the same kind of concept. We just measure it in meters or sometimes in feet or sometimes in micrometers. And then mass. Volume is just a combination of length, isn't it? Length times length times length. So volume is not a basic quantity. Length is the basic quantity. Oh, uh, we don't have time. Oh, yes, time is a basic quantity. So we have length and mass and time. OK, so I've got those three. Any other basic quantities? See, I'm not se saying seconds, because that would be a particular measure of the, a particular unit. But time, length, mass. Another one? Capacity. Capacity. Location. I think location is all described in terms of distance, in, in terms of that length thing. Density is a combination of mass divided by volume. Temperature is a more interesting one because temperature is a measure of energy, which is a complex quantity that turns out to be described by mass, length, and volume. Uh, me, mass, length, and time. So. Energy turns out to be, you can describe it in terms of mass, length, and time. Mm, chocolate? Oh, I thought I heard chocolate there. I was going to say, that is a basic quantity. I will tell you this. You can get through most all of your physics course and only have to deal with mass and length and time. Yeah, they throw in all the combinations. They make you do length by time, like miles per hour. They make you do areas, which is length by length. They make you do volume, which is length by length by length. They make you do density, which is mass by volume, so mass divided by length cubed. But it's not until you get later on, sometimes it's the second physics course before we get to charge, which is the next basic quantity. Uh, does anybody know what we push around here in that big uh, accelerator thing? Uh, electrons. electrons, which have a charge of uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, <laughs> which is basically uh, an interesting quantity. We, we, we don't have time to talk about Mr. Coulomb. But that must mean that you can't do what's going on. You can't talk about the math of what's going on around this place until you've taken at least the second physics course. So that's a little bit beyond what I would expect most people to know, except for those kids who have already stuck the fork into the electrical outlet. OK, you don't have to raise your hand, but I actually know someone who's done that. And uh, you got a charge out of it, I can, I can tell you that. Another question? I frightened you all. Oh, I see it. Yes. This is a ringer question. So why is the front ramp faster than the back ramp? Oh. <laughs> why is the front ramp faster? You noticed that, did you? Yeah. I didn't ask about that. 
But uh, yeah, you were supposed to notice. It's not just a little bit faster, it's a lot faster. But there, and yeah, and it's longer. So, so this must be something, mm, how do I describe it? I'm sorry, you'll have to take the physics course before I can describe it. But a quick explanation is, the fact that it gained this energy early, just like a pilot knows that he can just push the nose of the plane down and gain speed, the fact that it gained this speed early, even though it would give up the energy, it spends more of the time on the track going fast than the one that goes on the almost straight track because it goes kind of slow all the way. So e, because it spends more of the time going fast, or more of the distance, rather, going fast, it ends up at the end more quickly. Energetically, if we, were go, if we were to go and calculate the energy, they both have the same energy by the time they reach here because they've both fallen through the same distance. But again, that's, that's chapter five. <laughs> and it would have required a couple of more equations. And uh, I promised that you see there was only really three equations. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, what, for plasma, what kind of items are plasma, really? Plasma? Yeah. Oh. So, Plasma is just an, an, the next state of matter. You're familiar with solids. Okay, we, it's easy to do water because that's the convenient one that in, around our, the temperatures we live in, we can experience all three of all th four of them, really. You're familiar with ice. You melt it, it get water. You keep heating that up, it becomes steam. And that's just a different energy of the molecules. They happen to change states at certain places. They stick together when they're a solid. And they don't get more solid if you make it cold. They just get colder. They get smaller. When you have water, as you heat it up, it does get a little bit bigger as you heat it up. But at some temperature, the water molecules start to fly off, jump out of the pot. You've seen it happen, right? At that temperature, it's starting to turn into steam. If you keep going and you take the steam and you heat it up and get, add more energy and you add more energy and you add more energy and you add more energy, then the next thing happens. Instead of flying off, the molecules start to throw their electrons off. They are so energetic that the, well, you can think about it like the electrons can't keep up. But the electrons really are trying to get away and carry that energy away. Then you end up with a plasma where none of the electrons are staying with the uh, nucleus of the atom. If you cool it down, of course, it goes and gathers up a bunch of electrons again. If you keep cooling it down, it'll condense from the steam back into the water. And if you put that in the freezer, it'll make ice again. So it doesn't really make any change to the substance, but it changes its state. Did that help? What other things? Oh, we, what other states there are besides plasmas, or what other things will form a plasma? What other things will form a plasma? Uh, I, I suppose, given sufficient energy, you can take any substance and strip its electrons off. Okay, perhaps not any compound, because you probably break the, uh, the bonds of the compound. So let's talk, let's talk about every single element. Pick an element. We can probably make a plasma out of it if you get to sufficient temperatures. I don't know what those temperatures are. Is that it? So everything on the, on the periodic table. Some are easier than others. I'm sure. It just might be very expensive to get to that temperature to uh, make a titanium plasma. Uh, and that's usually the thing that stops us from, from doing things at a particular energy. It has taken a little bit of time to uh, come up with a device that raises the energy of this accelerator to the level that we're approaching now, 12 GeV. It started much less than that. And they thought when they first built it that they were at the limit. And they were at the limit for the capabilities then. And then they got better. So I, but I don't know what they, what they are. Question? they are aware of the helium shortage issue. 
And this is not the only place, although this is an important place because helium plays a big role in keeping things at superconducting temperatures. It is an issue. There's another issue with helium uh, being less prevalent, and that's in detectors that are used at the borders to look at trucks that are, that are coming across the border and at various other ports of entry. They use uh, uh, an isotope of helium as a neutron detector, which is a way they look for various weapons materials, dirty bombs, and things like that. They're running out of that, too, although they get it from a slightly different place. But yeah, uh, everyone hang on to your helium. Don't go to parties where they have helium balloons. Uh, preserve it. Save it. Bring it, bring it back here. We, we'll have a recycling. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> they have a helium liquefier, but they do not want the stuff that's in your balloons. OK, another question? Oh no, the, the art, this, no, this is mostly in relation to my skill saw and uh, so I did not try to approximate any particular curve. Had I done so, I might have tried to do a, a catenary curve, but I needed to have an energy change, so it wouldn't have been, a cat, wouldn't have been a easy to do catenary curve anyway. Four. Uh, yeah, probably fairly solid, but I, I'm not a, uh, despite having spent all those years with those astrophysicists, I managed to keep, keep them at bay and I built the instruments and let them do the theoretical physics. So I'm not a good one to ask about the uh, constituents of black holes, but I suggest that they are, uh, you better go ask somebody else. <laughs> And with that, can we thank Jack for tonight's talk? Yeah.